weeks ago, you may have read the headline that there is an IMF discussion paper that says India has almost eradicated extreme poverty in the country. Now, that discussion paper was published on the IMF website by a noted economist, Mr. Surjit Bhalla, who is right now also a director at the IMF. He was formerly a member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council in Prime Minister Modi's uh, council. Uh, today, we're speaking with Mr. Bhalla on that discussion paper, which became quite controversial. There were many who came up and said that that paper or that claim that India has eradicated extreme poverty was not a right one. And the method that was used to come to that conclusion was being disputed. Today, for the first time after that controversy really erupted, I'm speaking with Mr. Surjit Bhalla exclusively on ET Now. Mr. Bhalla, thank you so much for talking with us. Let me begin by talking to you about the paper that I have mentioned and asking you how you have defined extreme poverty. The extreme poverty is defined by the World Bank, uh, which is the gold standard for measurement of poverty and estimates of poverty. And that has been defined as 1.9 PPP dollars per day. Um, this was, remember the olden days, it was a dollar a day. That was a dollar PPP dollar a day, purchasing power parity. So this is a the standard classical definition of extreme poverty. Now, many countries have zero extreme poverty, like India is now having zero extreme poverty. Um, and uh, then there are other poverty lines as we proposed in, in our paper. And the one we propose for India to adopt is the lower middle income poverty line which is about 68% higher than the, uh, the extreme poverty line. Look, you know, it's really misunderstood. Poverty is going to be always with us in the sense of relative poverty. There are people who will be relatively poor at all times to come for sadiyon se hoga, sadiyon se tak hoga. So, you know, that's not a... Um, a, a profound statement. Uh, but what is important is that for developing countries, for poor countries, which have had a large amount of extreme poverty, this is a singular achievement uh, for India. Right, but coming down to the layman version of this, for our viewers who are watching, what do you mean in real terms? when you talk about what extreme poverty is, what are those parameters? That's also an important distinction and an important question. The only parameter taken into consideration, again, going strictly by the definition, is consumption. Um, not income, um, not wealth, but it is consumption. Each of those uh, parameters, each of those items have a different meaning. This is consumption and it is based on um, traditionally uh, forever, um, based on for years when you have surveys, it is based on per capita consumption in a household um, and by the consumer expenditure surveys. Now, Consumer expenditure surveys are not done by every country every year. Um, they come in gaps of about five to six years in the case of India. There was one in 2011-12, and there was one, what we in the paper call the ill-fated 2017-18, uh, which was six years later. Now, for the intervening period, and we'll come to that in a minute, for the intervening period, 2011-12 to 2017-18, the World Bank uses the consumption growth as indicated in the national accounts, which is exactly what we do to fill in from 2011-12 to 2017-18. Now, we 
had the 2017-18 consumer expenditure survey, and it is universally acknowledged uh, that it was close to nonsense. Um, so therefore, the government hasn't uh, used that survey. Um, the, the term used is bad data quality. Now, <clears throat> the World Bank has come up with several papers in the last few months, um, perhaps accelerated by our paper, uh, which also reaches the same conclusion that the 2017-18 survey was nonsensical, so that it cannot be used for any um, estimates of poverty. So we use the World Bank method for filling in uh, the years uh, exactly from 2017-18 to 2020. Now, so therefore from the entire period 2011-12, when we had a survey to 2020. Now, an important innovation in our study, and we believe it's the first time this has ever been done, um, is to incorporate the uh, results or the data on food subsidies. You know, the food subsidy uh, that we have, and this was the olden PDS, public distribution subsidy, which has been going on since about the late 70s, um, that has really accelerated and that has value. It may not have value uh, for rich people, even middle class people, but for poor people, it has a lot of value. Uh, the food subsidy alone accounted for 15 to 20% of the consumption of the poorest. So this is, um, and we have data on there, uh, free food was being given, uh, as well as the PDS food, uh, which, which is five kilograms uh, for rupees two uh, for wheat and rupees three for rice. As you know, the market price of wheat and rice is somewhere between today, 25 to 35 rupees. So this is a lot of subsidy uh, for the poor. And we incorporate the effects of that uh, in terms of their consumption and therefore their poverty level. So this methodology, as I'm sure you're well aware, has attracted a fair bit of criticism uh, and suggests that monetizing the value of those food subsidies and adding it to the income, very loosely put, of the recipients does not give the full picture. What do you have to say to that? What I have to say is that I'm afraid uh, there is a miscommunication or, will, or a willful misinterpretation. Uh, please tell me and ask those very same people as to what they would give. The, the, the definition is very straightforward. We account forever, we've done. And you know, India was the very first country to come up with a poverty estimate way back in, 19, in the mid 1960s. It's the same definition. So I don't understand what is this that, oh, you know, it doesn't give you the full picture. Well, it never gave you the full picture. Please tell me what the full picture is. The full picture is poverty is defined by consumption. I'll go ahead and measure consumption. The government will go ahead and measure consumption. The analyst will go ahead and measure consumption. That's the full picture. I'm afraid I don't understand, and you should ask those very same uh, critis critics or criticism as to what is the full picture. It's a full picture of consumption, not of income, not of wealth and not of general well-being and infant mortality and education and all the other parameters that affect our lives um, and the poor people's lives. This is the strict definition and we can you know, have a definition and you'll have an estimate, absolutely fair. But this is according to the 1.9 PPP dollars World Bank defined for all the countries in the world. Sure. Do you think that um, the entire debate has taken on a, a sort of a political um, 
slant as well because effectively what your paper is suggesting is that the government of the day through their food subsidy programs implemented and rolled out during the first year of the pandemic managed to keep a lot of Indians out of the extreme poverty threshold at a time when many people in the world sunk into further poverty. You know, I, you've seen, uh, you must have seen the programs, and I'm sure ET also did it. Um, when uh, the UP elections were going on, uh, many enterprising reporters went to UP to ask people, are they getting the food subsidy? And, and you know, many of them answered, yes, we are, and we are getting, and, you know, many TV networks took it off the air. Uh, because it didn't suit their political purposes. But the fact remains, there's considerable bit of evidence that the people were receiving the subsidy. Remember, we have had the PDS system since the late 70s. And if you remember the Rajiv Gandhi line in, 19, in 1985, that um, you know, only 15% of the money allocated to the poor actually gets to the poor. And he was absolutely right. Study after study has documented that only 15% went to the poor. Now this PDS system has been made very, very effective um, by the One Nation, One Card, the Aadhaar, this little instrument which everybody has. And uh, there's targeting, there's very, very good targeting, there's very good information there's very good targeting, and the One Nation, One Card. So this was uh, the, the innovation by the government, by the Modi government, of One Nation, One Card. You know, it's amazing that for 30, 40 years, we did not have that simple, uh, that simple card. But it's been made possible now because of technology. So the amount was delivered more effectively than ever before. Second, that a, an extra five kilograms of rice and or wheat was delivered free to uh, the recipients. So therefore, and this is part of the Food Security Act, uh, which was passed in 2013 and implemented uh, as it happened as soon as the Modi government came into power by them. So, you know, this is a very straightforward um, accounting that we have done uh, of the effectiveness of the subsidy, as well, of the food subsidy, and only wheat and rice. Mind you, uh, we do not take into account sugar subsidy that has also been going on. We do not take into account the free chulas that individuals had. We did not, the poor people had. We did not take into account housing which has a flow of income which, and consumption, which we did not include. So this is a very conservative uh, estimate uh, of uh, what the actual decline in poverty has been. Uh, it's much greater decline than we report in the paper if you take into account all the subsidies given to the poor and the effectiveness of reaching the poor by those subsidies. Do you think uh, it is time to redefine poverty? Because how poverty is defined in India has always been an issue of debate, controversy, and often a political issue. This came up during the UPA era as well on how many rupees per day should mark the line or below poverty line um, watershed. In your view, do you think it's time to relook at these parameters? Okay, now look, this issue has been discussed for, let's say since the mid sixties, uh, that make it 60 years, examined threadbare by every analyst, including ourselves, uh, by every government in the world, you know, even the US has a poverty line. So there are various definitions, as I said, of poverty. First of all, let me just point out that, you know, I'm sure, ET now didn't do the uh, show back in 2004 um, when the poverty line was raised. 
by about 20%. So, you know, that just was accepted. That was okay. There was no definitional issues, all these issues that you are bringing up. Every country, um, and you know, India has been the trendsetter in terms of what the world accepts because we used to house, uh, along with China, the largest proportion of poor in the world. Now, China data is not readily accessible. So what the World Bank has done, um, and I was there in the World Bank in uh, the 80s, um, is take basically the Indian, the dollar a day that we all remember was the Indian poverty line as the $1.25 uh, a day was the Indian poverty line, as is the $1.9 a day as the Indian poverty line. So, so what I mean is as of today, what I mean is as, what I mean is as of today, is it time to redefine what the poverty line is in the Indian context? Because the broader approach and you know, need or aim at the end of the day is to ensure that more and more Indians have greater welfare, have a better standard of living. So in that sense, do you think we need to reset our goals to a higher level? Absolutely. That's why we say that raise the poverty line, this particular measure to 3.2 PPP dollars a day, which is 68% higher. Absolutely. As you know, just like we did in 2004, five, when we became richer than or less poor than we were in the 60s, we raised the poverty line. Now, 14 years later, time has come to absolutely raise the poverty line. The extreme poverty line of 1.9 makes no meaning for India anymore, uh, makes no meaning for China anymore. And they also are claiming to have uh, eliminated extreme poverty. Uh, but it does have meaning for the poor people in uh, certain countries in Africa. Uh, Latin America, uh, perhaps uh, some countries have 5 to 10% uh, extreme poverty. And Africa is where uh, you have much larger proportions. So there we should stick or the World Bank sticks with the 1.9. That's why there's a poverty line for poor countries, lower middle income countries, middle income countries, upper middle income, income countries, and the rich countries. And we will move and should move the poverty line as India becomes less poor or richer. Choose your preference. So let me bring the conversation to the current day context. Um, COVID-19 and the worst of the economic impact of COVID-19 seems to be behind us for now. But demand, consumption demand, still needs to come back to pre-COVID levels in a lot of areas. Now we have the onslaught of inflation, and that really is the big fear, global factors, etc. What is that going to do to the incomes and the propensity to spend for Indians, especially um, the large section of middle class Indians? Look, <clears throat> inflation uh, has always been with us. Inflation will be with us. That's nothing uh, abnormal. Inflation has gone up, but it's important. What you're raising is important to understand the dynamics of inflation in order to then account for, adjust for, and prepare for the consequences, whether in monetary policy or fiscal policy around the world. Now, you know, in many ways, the whole class failed. The whole class meaning the entire set of advisors and policymakers uh, in the world. So what happened? As you can see, India's inflation rate may be 7%, 7.5%, 65 and obviously it varies whether you take core or whether you take the overall. Uh, we are much lower than most of the countries, uh, developing countries, and even lower than the United States. Um, so what has happened? This has never before been seen, the following. We had a pandemic, and in my understanding, in my view, uh, that the pandemic resulted in lockdowns around the world. 
we were one of the earliest to get out of the lockdown uh, back in July of 2020. Many other countries persisted with the lockdown. That means there was a supply shock. Everybody has understood that there was a supply shock. Though some people, when the lockdown occurred, were saying it was a demand shock. Well, obviously it was a demand shock in the sense that people didn't have the incomes, but more importantly, it was a supply shock uh, that there weren't people to go out and work because of, in my view, mistaken policy of lockdowns. Now, the whole world emerges, recognizes that uh, the lockdowns were not very effective in controlling the virus and moved away from lockdown, even though the, the virus was still there. And when they, they moved away from lockdown, suddenly you had a huge expansion in world demand. Now, none of our policymakers, and including me, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not a policymaker, but analyst, but really thought about when in history in the world has the entire world gone through a joint supply shock, which is uh, a lockdown, and yeah. emerged at the same time from that supply shock. Now, you know, supply will take time. Uh, in order to reach. And then we have China, one of the major countries uh, in the supply chains issue or uh, question, and again, going into lockdowns. But, but sir, if, I, if, I, if, I, if you will allow me to bring you back to the question that I've come to you with, I want to understand the impact on ordinary Indians today. Um, I understand that inflation is something which is here to stay. There are global reasons for it. Perhaps a little, very limited leeway to what the government of the day can do. But I'm trying to understand what this will do to ordinary Indians for the next few months or maybe a longer period of time. Okay, uh, very good. So what we had last year or the year before, very low inflation and very low growth, okay? So that was bad. Um, now what you have is somewhat higher inflation and much higher growth, economic growth, incomes growth, consumption growth. So this is no different than what any country has faced at any time in history. There's growth, real income growth, which is your incomes and your consumption growing faster than the rate of inflation, and you have uh, inflation. So I, I don't see, inflation is not by itself. Remember, people are now going out to work. People are now earning incomes, and therefore their, their consumption is going up and poverty is going down. So we, don't, we cannot continue with the policy that we had and the world had, and that's what the world is recognizing. They're taking away the fiscal stimulus gradually, and uh, in order to compensate for the fact you have high inflation, but you also have higher growth. So it's two sides of the same coin. What we have to look at is real income growth and real consumption growth, which is income growth over and above inflation. And that's what's happening in India, in spades. India is the fastest growing major economy this year and likely, and also next year projected and perhaps for the next several years. So going forward, and, and I know that uh, you've requested we don't speak specifically of Sri Lanka, we will not be doing that, but I want to understand on a global level, as we continue with these supply chain shocks, which is a overhang of the pandemic, we now have a geopolitical situation which has worsened um, the whole scenario. What will it take for countries to survive? And will we be seeing more countries which will find it very difficult and maybe on the brink of bankruptcy? Look, um, you know, we've had, the world has had a, a shock, um, double shock, first the pandemic and now the conflict in Ukraine. Um, and this is a world problem. This is not an Indian problem. 
and the world leaders are joining together, have joined together in order to solve uh, the conflict in Ukraine, hopefully through diplomacy and negotiations and discussion and not through conflict. Um, I hope, I imagine, I dream of a world free of conflicts so that all the policymakers in every country can proceed towards increasing the welfare of their countrymen and countrywomen, country citizens. So uh, I think, you know, the world has gone through an extraordinary time. Um, some of it uh, man-made, perhaps most of it man-made. Will we see more nations which may now find themselves on the brink of bankruptcy? The world and these nations that you're talking about have, you know, this has happened many, many times before in different, uh, sometimes different countries, sometimes the same country. Um, this is the first time ever in its history that Sri Lanka is in uh, the situation it is in. Um, this is the first time that Ukraine uh, is in the situation it is in. So, you know, um, it's sad, it's unfortunate, and countries have emerged out of crises in the past, and I imagine the same will happen now. Um, just read your history, and uh, countries have problems. Remember, in 1991, uh, we went to the IMF. Uh, we had no reserves. Um, so, you know, uh, this happens. We came out of it, and I'm sure the other countries will come out of their situation. All right, thank you so much for speaking with us, Mr. Surjit Bala. I believe this is your first interview. Thank you since, very much. Uh, that paper on extreme poverty, and uh, I'm glad that you took out the time to speak with us.